This is going to be an overview of the book of 2 Samuel. And this is another great book. And if you look at the first 10 chapters, think about it as David's life before the matter of Uriah the Hittite. And if you look at 14 through 25, think about it after the matter of Uriah the Hittite. And to break it down even further, in chapters 1 through 10, you have the triumphs of David. In 11 through 12, you see the trespass of David. In 13 through 20, you see the troubles of David. And then in 21 through 24, you see the testimony of David. So with that small breakdown, let's look at each, each chapter. So in chapter 1, we see an amazing thing about the character of David. Although King Saul was David's enemy, a man who wanted him dead, David still is tore up about the death of Saul. And an Amalekite comes to David claiming to have slain King Saul. And he's trying to get brownie points with David. And I guarantee you he's surprised with David's reaction. In 2 Samuel 1, 14-17, it says, And David said unto him, How wast thou not afraid to stretch forth thine hand to destroy the Lord's anointed? And David called one of the young men and said, Go near and fall upon him. And he smote him that he died. And David said unto him, Thy blood be upon thy head, for thy mouth had testified against thee, saying, I have slain the Lord's anointed. And David lamented with this lamentation over Saul and over Jonathan his son. So the Amalekite who lies and ends up getting killed when he thought he would be exalted. But as David always says, he doesn't want to touch the Lord's anointed. Now think about your life. This should be your reaction when a person comes to you with something that could kill another Christian's testimony. You shouldn't revel in the fact that another Christian has fallen. You should say, how are you not afraid to stretch forth your hand against the Lord's anointed? Or how are you not afraid to open your mouth and let your tongue loose against the Lord's anointed? We shouldn't kick Christians while they're down. We shouldn't revel in the fact that they've fallen. Just like David does not revel in the death of his enemy. Other Christians aren't our enemies, even though they may seem like it. But in chapter 1, David mourns the death of Saul and Jonathan, Saul being his enemy, but Jonathan being his best friend, even though he is Saul's son. Now, David's humbleness leads him to being God's choice for king. And you see in chapter 2, the people choose David as king over the house of Judah, whereas Saul was the people's choice. And in 2 Samuel 2, 4, it says, And the men of Judah came, and there they anointed king they anointed David king over the house of Judah, and they told David, saying, that the men of Jabesh-Gilead were they that buried Saul. So he then found out that Abner was claiming the throne. And Abner set up Saul's son Ishbosheth as king. So David chose to just reign in Hebron until God would choose to have him reign over Israel, over all of Israel. And in chapter 3, a man named Abner joins David, but ends up getting murdered by Joab. And chapter 3 mentions the sons of David, three of them. And these three kids don't turn out to be good men. This goes to show you that godly men won't always produce godly men, which makes it nonsense to say a man is a failure just because his kids didn't turn out the way that you thought they should. You can't just always look at someone's kids and say, oh, well, they, they didn't have good parenting. That's not always the case. Absalom ended up trying to take David's throne and sort of succeeded at doing that a little bit. And Amnon rapes his own sister in chapter 13. And Ad Adonijah ends up trying to take the throne from Solomon, another son of David. So you see a lot of sin in the life of David's kids and David did mess up some in his life but overall the Bible calls him a man after God's own heart in 2 Samuel 4 8 you see David's attitude toward killing a righteous man 
In 2 Samuel 4, 8, it says, And they brought the head of Ishbosheth unto David to Hebron, and said to the king, Behold the head of Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, thine enemy, which sought thy life, and the Lord hath avenged my lord the king, this day of Saul and of his seed. Now watch David's reaction. And David answered Rechab and Bena, his brother, the sons of Rimmon, the Berothite, and said unto them, As the Lord liveth, who hath redeemed my soul out of all adversity, when one told me, saying, Behold, Saul is dead, thinking to have brought good tidings, I took hold of him and slew him in Ziklag, who thought that I would have given him a reward for his tidings. How much more when wicked men have slain a righteous person in his own house upon his own bed. Shall I not therefore now require his blood of your hand and take you away from the earth? And David commanded his young men and they slew them and cut off their hands and their feet and hang them up over the pool in Hebron. But they took the head of Ishbosheth and buried it in the sepulcher of Abner in Hebron. So Ishbosheth was murdered. But David doesn't revel in the fact that he was killed, even though this would cause him to reign over all of Israel. And he was willing to wait on the Lord's timing. He wasn't wanting to do something wicked to be able to reign over all of Israel. Just like the Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 4 didn't want to bow down to Satan to reign over the kingdoms. He would rather wait until the time that he was supposed to. And that's that coming future time, the millennial reign. But in chapter 5, you see David is anointed king over all Israel. And David the king pictures Jesus Christ as king at the second coming, a man of war. While we see in 1 Kings that Solomon, David's son, pictures Jesus Christ as he rules on the throne in the millennium. You'll see Solomon ruling during a time of peace. And 2 Samuel 5, 3 through 4 says, So all the elders of Israel came to the king to Hebron. And King David made a league with them in Hebron before the Lord, and they anointed David king over Israel. David was 30 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 40 years. So here David is made king over all of Israel. Notice that David began his reign at 30 years old, just like Jesus began his earthly ministry at 30 years old. And like Joseph started being the second ruler with Pharaoh when he was 30 years old. So you see, David and Joseph have many attributes that are just like the Lord Jesus Christ. Many of their their life is, is just like his. And they're great types of the Lord Jesus Christ. And David moves the capital to Jerusalem in chapter 5. And in chapter 6, David wants to bring the ark to Jerusalem, but he does it the wrong way. The ark was supposed to be carried on men's shoulders with staves. As it says in Exodus 25, 14, it says, And thou shalt put the staves into the rings by the sides of the ark, that the ark may be borne with them. So David borrowed an idea from the Philistines by putting it on a new cart. He put the ark on a new cart. And this led to a man's death. David was trying to do something good but sort of copied the world's way doing it. Sound familiar? In 2 Samuel 6, 5 through 7, it says, And David and all the house of Israel played before the Lord on all manner of instruments, made of fir wood, even on harps and on saw trees and on timbrels and on cornets and on cymbals. And when they came to Nacon's threshing floor, Uzzah put forth his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen shook it. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah. And God smote him there for his heir, and there he died by the ark of God. So Uzzah touched the ark and was put to death. Sometimes you can do a thing good you can do a good thing by doing it the wrong way, and you end up hurting someone else. David wanted to do a good thing. He did it the wrong way. It ended up with a man dying. Uh, Billy Graham may have led a lot of people to the Lord, but how many did he lead astray by compromising with the worldly crowd? Does the way Christianity looks today, with all the compromise, could that be linked to what 
Billy Graham did a long time ago. Uh, 2 Samuel 7, 12 through 16 says, And when thy days be fulfilled, thou shalt sleep with thy fathers. I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build an house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men, and with the stripes of the children of men. But my mercy shall not depart away from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before thee. And thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. The throne shall be established forever. So David has what is called the sheer mercies of David, likened to New Testament eternal security. When David commits murder and adultery, God puts away the sin, and David isn't put to death for those sins. Now, he faces some consequences. He's chastened. It says, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men. But David had the sheer mercies of David, and this in Second Samuel 7 is the covenant between God and David. And in chapter 8, David consolidates his kingdom. In 2 Samuel 8, 13, it says, And David get him a name when he returned from smiting of the Syrians in the valley of salt, being 18,000 men. So David makes a name for himself in battle. It says he get him a name. And you can make a name for yourself just by serving the Lord and winning spiritual battles. You don't have to self-promote like you see everyone doing today. Wait for God to promote you if he wants to. You just focus on promoting the Lord Jesus Christ. And in 2 Samuel chapter 9, we see a great picture of the grace of God. In 2 Samuel 9, 1, it says, And David said, Is there yet any that is left of the house of Saul, that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Picture David as our heavenly father. Picture the house of Saul as the enemies of God, which was us before salvation. And then picture Jonathan as the Lord Jesus Christ. David, picturing our Heavenly Father, wants to show kindness to someone in the house of Saul, the enemy, for Jonathan's sake. Jonathan picturing Jesus Christ. In Ephesians 4.32, referring to us, it says, And be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. So why were you forgiven? For Christ's sake. Just like David wants to show, he wants to be kind to someone for Jonathan's sake. Now look back at Second Samuel 9, 2 and 3, and it says, And there was of the house of Saul a servant whose name was Ziba. And when they had called him, called him unto David, the king said unto him, Art thou Ziba? And he said, Thy servant is he. And the king said, Is there not yet any of the house of Saul, that I might show the kindness of God unto him? And Ziba said unto the king, Jonathan hath yet a son, which is lame on his feet. So this son of Jonathan is lame on his feet, just like we were without strength. You see the, the connection here in Romans 5, 6. It says, For when we were yet without strength... In due time, Christ died for the ungodly. You see, we were lame through a fall, just like this guy is lame on his feet. Uh, Adam and Eve fell in the garden, and from then on, man has a sin nature, and we're lame through that fall. We, were that, we are without strength. Now, verses 9, 4 through 9, 7 says, And the king said unto him, Where is he? And Ziba said unto the king, Behold, he is in the house of Maker, the son of Amiel, and Lodibar. Then king David sent and fetched him out of the house of Maker, the son of Amiel, from Lodibar. Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was coming to David, he fell on his face and did reverence. And David said, Mephibosheth. And he answered, Behold thy servant. And David said unto him, Fear not, for I will surely show thee kindness for Jonathan thy father's sake, and will restore thee all the land of Saul thy father, and thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. So you see, Mephibosheth wasn't getting something because of anything he did, but rather for Jonathan's sake. Just like our salvation isn't given to us because of what we did, we get it by faith when we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did for us on the cross, his death, burial, and resurrection. 
Now verse 8, And he bowed himself and said, Why, What is thy servant that thou shouldest look upon such a dead dog as I am? You see, that is the correct attitude for someone to have about themselves when they get born again. You need to see yourself as a sinner, a dead dog that's not worth anything whatsoever, and look to Jesus Christ to get your righteousness by believing on him as your crucified, buried, and risen Savior. Now, 2 Samuel 9 and verse 9 says, Then the king said to Ziba, Saul's servant, and said unto him, I have given unto thy master's sons all that pertain to Saul and to all his house. So if you are saved, then you're going to get some things. You are a child of the king. In John 14, 2 through 3, it says, In my father's house are many mansions. If I were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So there you see that you're going to get some things. And in 1 Peter 1, 4, it says, To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. If you're saved, you got something reserved for you. And David said there, Then the king called to Ziba, Saul's servant, and said unto him, I have given unto thy master's son all that pertain to Saul and to all that his house. There, there, thou therefore and thy sons and thy servants shall till the land for him, and thou shalt bring in the fruits, that thy master's son may have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, thy master's son, shall eat always at my table. Now Ziba had fifteen sons and twenty servants. Then Ziba said unto the king, According to all that my lord the king hath commanded his servant, so shall thy servant do. As for Mephibosheth, said the king, he shall eat at my table as one of the king's sons. And Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah. And all that dwelt in the house of Ziba were servants unto Mephibosheth. So Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, for he did eat continually at the king's table and was lame on both his feet. So Mephibosheth, a man lame through a fall, just like us, we were lame through a fall that happened way back in Genesis 3. Adam and Eve sinned and ate the fruit, and sin came into the blood, and we have a sin problem ever since. But thanks to God, he shows us kindness for Jesus' sake and saves us and will let us sit at his table. So that's a great story on the grace of God in Second Samuel chapter 9. And then in chapter 10, you have a humorous story. And notice the Bible has, it has love, it has action, it has comedy. All the things people look for in a good novel or movie. People even like gore in movies, which I don't understand, but the Bible has that too. I, however, I don't like that type type of stuff but in the bible it's not bad in the bible you see in the movies when you watch that stuff it's in a sinful context in the bible it's in a completely different context for example i can enjoy the stories about the the battles the fights like samson just demolishing a thousand men with the jawbone of an ass that's awesome uh, you know that's not a sin to like that type of stuff Whereas when you watch a movie with wicked things in it, you know, that's wrong. But see, the Bible puts it in a good context, whereas Hollywood has it in a, a bad context. But here in chapter 10, you have a funny story about David's servants. In 2 Samuel 10, 4 through 5, it says, Wherefore Hanan took David's servants and sh shaved off the one half of their beards and cut off their garments in the middle, even to their buttocks. And sent them away. When they told it unto David, he sent to meet them, because the men were greatly ashamed. And the king said, Tarry at Jericho until your beards be grown, and then return. So the, David's men got their beards shaved off, got the one half of their beards shaved off, and they got their garments cut off, even to the buttocks. So imagine how funny they looked. That's one of the more humorous stories in the Bible but then just like any story it goes from funny to sad and tragic in chapter 11 you have the matter of Uriah the Hittite David is at home and he's idle at the time as they say an idle mind is the devil's workshop you don't need idle hands 
Uh, Paul over and over again talks about working with your hands and pretty much staying busy. But David is idle at this time, and he sees Bathsheba bathing. He lusts after her and then takes her. He gives into the lust of the flesh. You see, David is a type of Jesus Christ, but Jesus Christ never gave in to the lusts of the flesh. But David ends up getting Bathsheba pregnant, as you know, and he then has her husband Uriah killed. Uh, and that is a scary how a righteous man like David could travel so far down the road of sin to end up committing adultery and murder and also tried to get Uriah drunk one night so that he would go home and lay with his wife and think that he got her pregnant himself. But that didn't work out for him. But just a long list of sin that came from that sin of looking at another man's wife. And it starts with a look. That's why women shouldn't wear tight clothes. They shouldn't show their thighs. They shouldn't wear any type of clothes that shows their body because it all starts with a look. So people remember David most because of this story that's how they remember him almost as much if not more than they remember his battle with Goliath and even in the Bible in 1 Kings 15 5 it says because David did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord and turned not aside from anything that he commanded him all the days of his life save only in the matter of Uriah the Hittite the Lord had Nathan the prophet to come and confront David about his sin that he committed with Bathsheba and David repented with a sincere heart instead of getting mad at the preacher. And this shows a good heart toward God, being able to repent at the preaching of the Word of God after being shown you were wrong from the Word of God. And David even went on to name one of his sons after the preacher, Nathan. In First Chronicles 3, 5, you can read that. But because of the sin David committed, the child that he was having end up di ended up dying but notice David's attitude about his child is that he wants to keep it as you see in uh, 2 Samuel 12 and that's a that's a lot different than how it is today many times people commit sexual act today they get a woman pregnant and the first thing they want to do is abort the child but notice David's attitude is he wanted he wanted the child he didn't want the child to die David wanted the child to live, even though he was a man who just committed murder and adultery. He wasn't so far down a road that he wanted to murder his child. So when a parent, especially a mother, doesn't want her child, that's disturbing to say the least and is completely unnatural affection. That just goes against nature. And I see that as just as unnatural as homosexuality is against nature. A woman not wanting her child is is just so far from from what's natural. Or a father not wanting his son, that's just a wicked sin. But David's sin resulted in a lot of trouble with his kids, as we talked about earlier. As, as we said, the child died. Absalom, his other son, killed Amnon, his son. And Amnon, who raped Tamar Joab killed Absalom so Absalom gets murdered and Ad Adonijah his other son was killed by Benaiah so you see just a lot of trouble in his family most likely as a result from this sin maybe he wasn't there for his sons like he should have been after that sin with Uriah the Hittite and Bathsheba and it just goes to show you, you can't sin and get by. As it says in Galatians 6, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. You can sow some things that are bad, you're going to reap those things. And in chapter 13, you have David's son, Amnon, who is in love with his own sister. Amnon doesn't know how to get his sister. But he has an old friend named Jonadab who helps him devise a plot to commit a sexual sin with his own sister. <clears throat> As we read in 2 Samuel 13, 5 through 6, And Jonadab said unto him, Lay thee down on thy bed, and make thyself sick. And when thy father cometh to see thee, say unto him, I pray thee, let my sister Tamar come, and give me meat, and dress the meat in my sight, that I may see it and eat it at her hand. So Amnon lay down and made himself sick. And when the king was come to see him, 
Amnon said unto the king, I pray thee, let Tamar my sister come, and make me a couple of cakes in my side, that I may eat at her hand. And in Second Samuel thirteen eleven through 12, it says, And when she had brought them unto him to eat, he took hold of her, and said unto her, Come lie with me, my sister. And she answered him, Nay, my brother, do not force me, for no such thing ought to be done in Israel. Do not thou this folly. Notice what the result of this sexual sin was. You see here how Amnon forced his sister, basically raped his sister. Then look at the feelings he has for her after the fact. In verse 15 it says, Then Amnon hated her exceedingly, so that the hatred wherewith he hated her was greater than the love wherewith he had loved her. And Amnon said unto her, Arise, be gone. So he loved her, but after the sexual act was committed, he then hated her. Such is true today. Many times a young couple will fornicate, and then the young man has no use for the girl. He will say he hates her, and then put send her on her way after the sinful act. But because of the sin in David's own life, it seems he couldn't keep good check on his sons. This is why it's good for dads to live as godly in front of their kids as possible. A father shouldn't admire the body of a, another woman in front of his son. I've seen many times a father will look at celebrities or maybe just a woman walking down the street and comment about how the woman looks in front of his son. This is a hor horrible example for your son to let him see you looking at someone other than his mother. Because he's going to think that's cool, he's going to think that's all right, and that's how he's going to treat his wife. But Absalom was so mad about Amnon raping his sister Tamar that Absalom, David's other son, kills Amnon. And this also puts him next in line for the throne. In chapter 15, Absalom rebels against David, and even though David loves Absalom, Absalom becomes a thorn in the flesh. In chapter 16, Absalom commits sexual sin with David concubines. The, that's just the ultimate backstabbing there. And notice the great amount of sexual sins in David's family after his sin with Bathsheba. A long list of those types of sins. In chapter 17, Ziba and Shemaiah both do David dirty. David's life just takes a turn for the worst after that your matter of Uriah the Hittite. The Lord can use men to be a thorn in the flesh, and one of the hardest things to do in your Christian life is to deal with other people and have the right reaction. But most of the time, David does have the right reaction. And in chapter 18, you will see the death of Absalom. And although Absalom wanted to kill David and went into his concubines, David still mourns the death of his son Absalom. So you, so you see that, that unconditional love toward your kids that David has that many people don't have today. I mean, if, if a kid breaks the remote or something, the, the family's ready to put him up for adoption. But you see, David loved Absalom. And in chapter 19, David is restored to the throne. In chapter 20, you have Sheba who revolts against David. And just like great men today, you see there is a whole big crowd who loves and follows a man. And then there's a whole big crowd who hates the man. Look at uh, 2 Samuel 20, 1 through 2, it says, And there happened to be there a man of Bilal, whose name was Sheba, the son of Bichri, a Benjamite. And he blew a trumpet and said, We have no part in David. Neither have we inheritance in the son of Jesse. Every man to his tents, O Israel. So every man of Israel ran up from after David and followed Sheba, the son of Bichri. But the men of Judah clave unto their king from Jordan even to Jerusalem. So you see there how you got a whole bunch of people that love this guy but hate this guy and a whole bunch of people that love this guy but they hate this guy. So just like all the great preachers, you have a man who starts a movement and gets a lot of followers and then he will have just as many people who wish he was dead. And I guess the well-known ones right now are men like Charles Lawson. You have a lot of people that hate him, a lot of people that can't stand him. Ralph Sexton Jr., same way. Robert Breaker, Gene Kim, even Steven Anderson. You got all these people that love him over here. All these people that hate him over here. You got Peter Ruckman, who's dead now, but 
tons of people love him. Tons of people despise him. One of the most hated, yet one of the most loved preachers. All these men have thousands of men who love them, but then there is just as many who also hate them, and they go with the other guy. What you should do is listen to all of them. Write down every good thing they say and then ignore every bad thing they say. But in chapter 21, David sees three years of famine. And in your spiritual life, you're going to see famine. This means you need to learn how to get meat for yourself. Don't just rely on someone else to feed you all the time. In chapter 23, you have David's mighty men. And they are some of the coolest and toughest characters in the Bible. In 2 Samuel 23, 8. It says, These be the names of the mighty men whom David had. The Tecmonite that sat in the seat, chief among the captains. The same was Adino the Esnite. He lift up his spear against 800 whom he slew at one time. I mean, have you ever seen Tony Yah and Jet Lee and Jackie Chan and Donnie Yen and Bruce Lee and Jason Statham and Dwayne Johnson and Sylvester Stallone and Arnold or any of those guys knock out 800 men at one time? They haven't even done that in the movies. You couldn't even have a scene in a movie long enough to show a dude knock out 800 guys at one time. And then 2 Samuel 23, 9 through 10, and it says, And after him was Eliezer, the son of Dodo, the Ahohite, one of the three mighty men with David when they defied the, defied the Philistines, defied the Philistines that were gathered together to battle. And the men of Israel were gone away. He arose and smote the Philistines until his hand was weary. And his hand clave into the sword, and the Lord wrought a great victory that day, and the people returned after him only to spoil. So his hand clave into the sword. That should be your verse. Hebrews 4.12 shows you the word of God is your sword. Your hand should cleave into the sword. Let the high praises of God be in your mouth as a two-edged sword in, and a two-edged sword in your hand, as the book of Psalms says. Don't give up because you've got the sword. And the people returned after him only to spoil, it says. So you see, he did the work, but the people, you got a lot of people that want to come afterwards and get the benefits of the victory, even though they didn't do anything. And then in verses 11 and 12, it says, And after him was Shema, the son of Agi, the Herorite, and the Philistines were gathered together into a troop where was a piece of ground full of lentils, and the people fled from the Philistines. But he stood in the midst of the ground and defended it and slew the Philistines, and the Lord wrought a great victory. Compare this to you. Are you ready to defend? Defend the gospel against false prophets. Defend the King James Bible against Bible correctors. Defend Jesus Christ against Hollywood. Defend marriage against the sodomites. Defend children against pedophiles and abortion. Stand in defense. Get the defense. Get the get the defensive Christian of the Year award here, is what this guy would have gotten. But see all these great, mighty men of David. And you, you have this other guy, other guy here, in Second Samuel twenty three thirteen through seventeen. And three of the thirty chief went down and came to David in the harvest time into the cave of Adullam, and the troop of the Philistines pitched in the valley of Rephaim. And David was then in the hold, and the garrison of the Philistines was then in Bethlehem. And David longed and said, Oh, that one would give me drink of the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. And the three mighty men broke through the host of the Philistines and drew water out of the well of Bethlehem that was by the gate and took it and brought it to David. Nevertheless, he would not drink thereof, but poured it out unto the Lord. And he said, Be it far from me, O Lord, that I should do this. Is not this the blood of the men that went in jeopardy of their lives? Therefore he would not drink it. These things did these three mighty men. So that's one of my favorite stories in the Bible. David has three mighty men go get him some water, and they have to kick butt to do it along the way. That would make a great little movie right there. But David doesn't drink the water. He pours it out into the Lord. And I've often wondered, maybe that's where the rappers get the idea to pour out a little liquor for their dead homies as they're always doing but that's just one of my favorite stories in the bible there but david was a man after god's own heart he thought about the lord first then second samuel twenty three eighteen says and abasha the brother of joab the son of zeruiah was chief among three he lifted up his spear against three hundred and slew them 
and had the name among the three. So this guy could have went to war against 300 Spartans in one because he had God. If God be for us, who can be against us? Then Second Samuel twenty three nineteen through 20. Was he not most honorable, honorable of three? Therefore he was their captain. Howbeit he attained not unto the first three. And Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, the son of a valiant man of Kabzal, who had done many acts, he slew two lion-like men of Moab. He went down also and slew a lion in the midst of a pit in time of snow. So this guy not only killed a lion, but did it in bad weather. And as a Christian, you're going against a roaring lion, singing whom he may devour. And he will come at you in times of snow. He'll come at you when times are hard. Now look at verse 21. And he slew an Egyptian, a goodly man. And the Egyptian had a spear in his hand, but he went down to him with a staff and plucked the spear of the Egyptian's hand and slew him with his own spear. And what's Egypt like in the Bible? It's a type of the world. This can picture how you got to fight against the world. Many times have to beat it at its own game. Take the enemy's weapon and use it to cut his head off, just like David did and just like this guy did. And my friend Danny Castle will show video presentations of the world's music to expose to people how wicked the world is. So in a sense, he's taking the world's weapon and using it to cut the devil's head off. And in chapter 24, the anger of the Lord is kindled against David for numbering Israel. And since David numbered Israel, he had to make a choice about what punishment he would like to have. And I'm sure you have had that happen before and with your parents. This is where that idea comes from. You know, your parents say you can either have this happen or that happen. When I was in school and I got in trouble for skipping class, the principal said, you can either pick up trash outside or get a paddling. So I took the paddling. But you just see how David's sins affected so many people. And so many people died as the result of this sin David did of numbering the people. And your sin affects a lot of people. It says in Romans fourteen seven, For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. You've always got somebody watching you, always somebody looking up to you. You just need to make the right decisions and just be a man after God's own heart like David was. Even though he failed, you, even though he, you failed, you can still be a man after God's own heart. But this has been Second Samuel Overview.